In the Old Testament, Jesus said, All who hate me love death. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Accepting Him as your Lord and Savior and choosing to follow Him puts you on the way. Obeying the truth of God's Word keeps you on the way, the way that ends in eternal life. Your eternal destiny will be determined by your choices in this world. Steps to Life exists to help people find the way, the truth, and the life. I want to study with you for a few minutes this evening about what we started studying about this morning, about dealing with heresy. And this is a huge subject. A large part of the New Testament is on this subject of dealing with heresy. We stand our Sabbath school class this morning when we were studying from the book of Galatians. What is the book of Galatians about? It's about dealing with heresy. Uh, the book of First, First Corinthians that's a large section of the book. So a large part of the Bible is on this subject, and a large part of the spirit of prophecy deals with this subject. And uh, it is a huge subject that we can't really cover. But uh, I want to look again at a few principal points that I hope will help you uh, in dealing with heresy, because every one of you, if you haven't in the past, you will have to, in the future, you will have to deal with heresy. Uh, it is something that every Christian will have to deal with. And here at Steps to Life, uh, we get CDs, DVDs, uh, books, uh, manuscripts, long pamphlets and letters about all, all sorts of new light that the people sending me things that, to straighten me out and get me to see the light. And I get telephone, a man called me, talked to him on the phone, he says, do you, do you see the light? Do you see this? Well, I don't understand it the way he understands it. And uh, so, when we get all these things, we have to look at it and ask ourselves the question and look at the Bible and say, well now, is there something about our teaching or our preaching that is wrong, that we need to change, or uh, is this really new light or not? So we have to evaluate it. You, every Christian has to go through this evaluating process when people tell you that they've found something new. I don't think I can even count the number of times people have called me on the phone and told me about that they had some new information, new light, that they wanted to tell to me so that I could be enlightened and understand what they understand. And actually, I want to know the new light. Do you want to know the new light? Uh, does God have more things to reveal to us? Well, yes. And so we must have an open mind because sometimes somebody might send us something and it might really be new light. And I have learned a lot from things that people have sent to me. But sometimes... And when you look at it, we say, wait a minute, is this really new light or is it some old heresy? And uh, when I studied theology, there's a saying among, when you study theology, that in theology there is nothing new. There's a lot of truth in that. Uh, many times people have come to me to talk to me about something that's new light, and I said, you know, that's not really not new. That was being taught by this person or that person 1,500 years ago or 1,700 years ago. Uh, so there's a lot of truth in that saying among theologians that there's nothing new in the area of theology. But we need to have our eyes open to the new light that God might send to us, and he might send it to us through some very obscure way, that through somebody that most people think is not qualified to send it to us or whatever. The Lord might send us new light in some way, some way that we don't expect. So we want to be open to new light, but we don't want to accept something that's heresy. And remember, as I said this morning, we're talking about heresy not in the commonly accepted usage of the term. The commonly accepted usage of the word heresy is, the common dictionary definition is something that is contrary to accepted dogma of the Roman Catholic Church. That is the common definition of heresy. So according to their definition, all Protestants would be heretics. And as I mentioned this morning, uh, the Pope around Vatican II, he said, we're not going to call the Protestants heretics anymore. We're going to call them separated brethren. And that's one of the things that initiated the, the great ecumenical movement that we have now. And they're not just going to call the Protestants separated brethren. They're going to reach out their hands to non-Christian religions and so forth. But every, every Christian, as we approach the end of the world, every one of us ha will have to evaluate many different things that, and say, well, now, is this really the new light or is this some kind of heresy where the devil's trying to get me off track? So we're going to take another look at dealing with heresy 
And because it's something everybody has to deal with, and before we look at the Bible and read the Bible about it, let's pray that the Lord will help us to understand what we're going to study. Father in heaven, we come to you very humbly. We remember the words of Solomon, the king, when he said to you, I am like a little child. I do not know how to come in or how to go out. And Lord, help us to realize our totally helpless condition, that unless you guide us and direct us by your spirit, that we are helpless and that we will be deceived unless you help us. And, but you have promised through your Son, Jesus Christ, that if we would ask, that we would receive the Holy Spirit. And so we come to you humbly but earnestly in his name, praying that we might receive the Holy Spirit and that you will guide and direct us into the way of truth and open our eyes to understand spiritual things and help us to be able to discern the difference between truth and error. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned this morning, a long time ago, many years ago, Elder W. D. Frazee preached a sermon entitled The Ministry of Heresies, and I told you, or showed you the quotation uh, that provided for him the seed thought for that sermon, which was in Volume 5 of Testimonies for the Church. Well, and White says that if God cannot arouse his people any other way, he'll send in heresies among them. And if the ministry of heresies does its work, of course, people can be saved. If it does not, they will be lost, and there will be people in spite of everything that God does. But they will not wake up until it's too late. That's clearly predicted in prophecy, and we do not want that to happen to us. In the book Upward Look, page 37, it says, Many, very many, will be terribly surprised when the Lord shall come suddenly, as a thief in the night. They'd be terribly surprised. They're not ready. Let's look at how a few texts, few more texts about how Jesus dealt with heresy. Jesus had to deal with heresy constantly during his ministry. We read this morning Acts 1.6 in which the disciples were asking him if he was going to restore the kingdom of Israel at that time. Uh, we could read from uh, Matthew 24, where he addressed his disciples and answered their question. We could read from Luke 17. Uh, let's turn to, there's many, we cannot read all the scriptures. Let's uh, turn uh, to Matthew 22 and... Matthew 22, this was one of the times when Jesus directly addressed the problem of heresy with the Sadducees. He did not always directly address the problem of heresy. Many times he sidestepped it and did not answer their heretical questions. He sidestepped the question or gave them an answer of a different kind that they weren't expecting. But this is one time when he directly dealt with a heresy of the Sadducees. This is Matthew 22, starts in verse 23. You can read the context there. It's about marriage in the kingdom of heaven. Who, which, uh, which man is going to get this woman in the kingdom of heaven? It says, starting in verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, You are mistaken, not knowing the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Now, this is an amazing answer that Jesus gave to them concerning, notice the scripture that he quoted. Now, the, Jesus was speaking on this occasion to the Sadducees. Now, you remember that the Sadducees did not believe in the inspiration of the whole Old Testament. They only acknowledged that the Torah, that, that's the books of Moses, that's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. 
That was all of the Bible that they recognized as fully inspired. Now, they didn't say it was wrong to read the rest, but the Torah was all that they recognized as being inspired. Now, I used to read this answer that Jesus gave, and I used to wonder why, why did... Why didn't Jesus tell him what Isaiah said about the resurrection of the dead? Isaiah spoke explicitly about the resurrection of the dead. And Jesus never even mentioned that. Why didn't he use that? Well, notice what Jesus did here. He approached the Sadducees on their own ground. He quoted to them concerning the resurrection. He quoted a text from the Torah. He did not quote a text from Isaiah, even though Isaiah was much more specific about the resurrection than Moses was. But he quoted to them a text that they had to acknowledge. Yes, that's in the Bible. Because he quoted to them from the Torah. That's just a principle that's nice to keep in mind when you're talking to somebody. And sometimes it's very difficult to know what to say to somebody because of what they believe. One time I was talking... <clears throat> I was giving Bible studies and visiting homes in the Chattanooga, Tennessee area. And I ran into a man who was a, in the steps to, uh, not steps, he was a member of the Church of Christ. There, I got it right. He was a member of the Church of Christ. Now, as I was talking to him, he made it very clear to me. Nothing that I could read to him, because you see, he and I, we had a difference of opinion about the law of God and the Sabbath and some things. And he made it very clear to me, I could not read to him anything from the Old Testament. He didn't put any credence in that. Neither could I read to him anything from the Gospels, because that was before the crucifixion, and the crucifixion changed everything. You know, we're New Testament, we're New Covenant Christians now, and so the Bible that I study is from Acts to Revelation. That's the Bible that I study. I thought to myself, well, I was about 19 years old at that time. I thought to myself, you know, I... I'm really not prepared to give him a Bible study right now. I have now prepared a Bible study. Actually, I think I could prepare a Bible study for that man. <laughs> I think I could give him a Bible study to get him started in act, between Acts and Revelation. But uh, for him, if you didn't quote, if you quoted to him something from the Gospels, well, it didn't mean anything. He didn't accept that because he he only acknowledged this part of the Bible. <clears throat> uh, there are people that have problems like that, of course, with uh, Ellen White. Uh, their belief in Ellen White is kind of fuzzy. They don't look on it as directly inspired, or they, they just believe when she said, I saw, or something like that. And so Jesus had to deal with this. He had to deal with the Sadducees who didn't believe in the whole Old Testament. They only believed in the Torah. And it's interesting that when he dealt with them, he told them they, that they were mistaken. They didn't understand the Scriptures, and they didn't understand the power of God. But when he went to prove his point from the Scriptures... He quoted from the scripture that they accepted. He quoted from the scripture that they accepted. Now there's many other examples like this in the scripture. In, uh, in Matthew 22, the same chapter, verses 41 to 46, there's uh, an interesting interchange there where Jesus asked the Jews a question having to do with the divinity and the humanity of the Messiah. The Messiah was both divine and human. And Jesus asked them a question that would force them to answer to, uh, on that, and they couldn't answer. They didn't understand that. Uh, in Acts 2, this is an example from uh, Peter. And uh, this is on the day of Pentecost, after the disciples had received the Holy Spirit. And in Acts 2, Peter's sermon starts in verse 14. Now, there were many, many things that Peter could have told them that Jesus had said, that Jesus had taught, and uh, not only parables and teachings and sermons, but also his miracles. But instead of talking about all those things, notice the two things that Peter draws to their attention. Number one, he quotes... For scripture, he quotes from the prophet Joel. That's in verses 16 to 21. And in verses 25 to 28 and onward after that, he talks about David. 
Now, you know why he talked about David? Ellen White explains why he talked about David. She says, if Peter had, he knew that anything that he would say to them, remember we studied this morning, heresy gets such a tight control of a person's mind that they're, 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 not even, they're not even open to evidence. And Peter knew that anything, any evidence that he gave to them concerning the words of Christ or anything about him, that they wouldn't accept it because of what they'd been taught, they'd rejected Christ. And so, Peter drew their minds back to the patriarch David. Did they, did they have fond memories and adore the memory of the patriarch David and of King David? Yes, they did. Notice what Peter did here. He was in a very difficult situation. He was addressing the people who had crucified the Son of God. And he tells them so later on. He, those are the people he was addressing. But before he tells them what they had done and, and that they had killed the Son of God on the cross of Calvary, he tries to get on common ground. He searches for some place. And where was the common ground that he could get with them? It was having to do with King David because they adored King David. And by talking to him them about that, he got on common ground. Now that's just a couple of quick examples. Both Jesus and Peter demonstrated when you're dealing with heresy, if possible, try to find some area where with the other person or people that you can have some common ground. Now, as I mentioned, every Christian has to deal with heresy. Every Christian has to meet up with ideas that are supposed to be new light and then you have to look at it and say, well now, is this really new light? Do I need, do I need to change my mind on this or this or this? Or is this, or is this just some old heresy that's been around for 1,500 years and has just been resurrected? So here's a few questions that it is perfectly appropriate to ask when you're having to deal and make a decision like that. Is this really new light or is it just some old heresy or some new heresy for that matter? A first question that it's very appropriate for any Christian to ask. This is going to be a brand new Christian that's just been baptized. They have a perfect right to ask this question. Anyone has a perfect right to ask this question when they're trying to evaluate, is this new light that I need to accept or is it just heresy? The first question is, does this teaching agree with all the statements in the Bible and the spirit of prophecy? And I could give you many examples, but I'm not going to. I, <clears throat> concerning a, a certain controversial teaching that I've dealt with for uh, over 25 years in Adventism, I have asked some people, I said, well now, look at this text here, how do you, how do you deal with this text with what it says here? And uh, concerning this teaching has to do with Daniel, the book of Daniel, so far I have not found even one person that can say, well, I, the way I understand it, it would relate like this. I haven't found anybody that can answer that question. But uh, we have a right to ask the question, does this teaching agree with all the statements in the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy? Now, it is very easy. Almost any heresy, you know, I had, a, I had a theology teacher, he's dead now, but I had a theology teacher back at Walla Walla College that used to tell us this. He used to say, in every heresy, there is a grain of truth. Do you understand that? There is a little bit, at the tree of knowledge of good and evil, was everything about what Eve was going to learn, was everything evil? No, it was good and evil. In every heresy, my theology teacher used to say, there is a grain of truth. But, what I have to ask is, does this teaching agree with all the statements in the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy? And so, if it doesn't agree with all of them, well then there's something we don't understand yet. If somebody says, well, this disagrees with that. Well, if the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy seem to disagree with one another, there's just something that we don't understand yet. That's all that means. And there's many illustrations that could be given of that. I have a, I had a book, I've had a book in my library now for probably 40 years. It's, it's written by an English uh, fellow, a doctor's degree in English, and he wrote a book called, Is That in the Bible? And there's a whole chapter in this book on contradictions in the Bible. So I thought, well, that's interesting. So I went down to look at all the contradictions. And uh, almost every single, just immediately, when I first got the book, I fi figured out that 
the reason he thinks there's contradictions is because he doesn't understand the text. He doesn't understand the text. Just to give you a quick example. Uh, in one of the Gospels, it mentions a certain thing happened when Jesus was going out of Jericho. In another of the Gospels, it mentions that it happened when he was going into Jericho. And skeptics said for a long time, they said, see there, one Gospel says it happened when he was leaving Jericho, one Gospel says it happened when it was, he was entering Jericho. Obviously, one of them has to be wrong, and so one of those, there's a mistake, therefore, in the Bible. Neither one of those positions are wrong. Because there was an old Jericho, and there was a new Jericho. And when you were leaving one, you were going into the other one. So neither gospel writer was in error. And there are many situations like that in the Bible where people that have not studied the Bible carefully think that there is a contradiction. But if you study it carefully, there's not a contradiction. Ellen White says this. In Patriarchs and Prophets is about page 114. She says the truth is consistent with itself in all its manifestations. Here's the Bible text about the same thing. It's in 1 John 2, 1 John 2, and verse 21, last part of the verse. It says, no lie is of the truth. No lie is of the truth. The truth agrees with itself. The truth is consistent with itself in all its manifestations. Ellen White says that God never contradicts himself. The truth is always consistent with itself. So the first question is, does this teaching that I'm being asked to evaluate, does it agree with all the statements in the Bible and in the spirit of prophecy? Here's a statement Ellen White says about that in the book Desire of Ages, page 458. She says, God does not compel men to give up their unbelief. Before them are light and darkness, truth and error. It is for them to decide which they will accept. The human mind is endowed with power to discriminate between right and wrong. God designs that men shall not decide from impulse, but from the weight of of evidence, carefully comparing Scripture with Scripture. She goes on to say there that the Jews were deceived because they didn't do that, that if they had compared Scripture with Scripture, they would have found out that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. She goes on to say in the next paragraph, uh, in Desire of Ages, page 459, that many people today are deceived the same way the Jews were deceived. They don't go to the scriptures and study the scriptures for themselves. They're, de they're dependent on some teacher, some preacher, some theologian to explain the truth to them. Well, that's the first question. Second question. We dealt with this a little bit this morning, but this is a question that is fair to ask. Is this teaching the teaching of the body of Christ? Is this teaching the teaching of the body of Christ. Now, of course, it is possible that this is new light and the body of Christ is not teaching it yet because it doesn't know it. Well, if that's the case, then I need to go to men of experience. I need to go to leaders and say, look, study this out. And if it's new light, well, then people of experience that study it and want to know the truth, they're going to accept it. And, they're, and the body of Christ is going to accept it. But what if it's a teaching that the body of Christ has rejected over and over again for hundreds of years? Well, in that case, we better, we better have some second thoughts. Here's a third question. I don't know why this is so often overlooked, but this is, Ellen White used to talk about this. She says, if you have found something new, submit it to men of experience. The third question is, have men of experience examined it? Have men of experience examined it? Uh, I wrote a book, not a really a book, actually a booklet. This was back in the early, early 1980s. And I, I, wrote the, I got the idea for writing this little booklet when I, I was uh, working at Southwestern Adventist College. And uh, I used to carry my Greek New Testament around with me everywhere I went. And I was reading it. And I was reading 1 John one day. And I thought, my, this is astonishing. I never noticed this before. And so I started studying it. And by the time I stayed, I wrote a little booklet that explained it. And it was a booklet about how you could quit sinning. 
And uh, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll explain this to some people. Well, people didn't like it. Uh, my, my, brother, my brother said, let's submit this to uh, the Biblical Research Institute, uh, the General Conference. So he did. Uh, I knew the people that worked there, the Biblical Research General Conference. Well, they were, they were really nervous about it because uh, uh, how to quit sinning for some reason was, a, was something that uh, people were scared of. And I said, well, okay, uh, the, everything in this book is just quoted directly from the Bible, but uh, if, it's, if, if you don't like it, I'm not trying to push it. We didn't, we didn't try to uh, push it on the college or push it on church or anything. We just submitted it to people of experience, and uh, they didn't seem to be... Uh, ready for it at that time. Uh, however, you're still free to read First uh, John, and First uh, John still says the same thing as said in the 1980s. Uh, but have men of experience examined it? What if men of experience don't accept it? Well, that's what happened with this booklet that I wrote. The men of experience were nervous about it. He said, "Okay, fine. We're not going to uh, we're not going to push it. We have it, but we're not going to to uh, push it. We're not going to try to." Uh, uh, Tell people about it if you're nervous about it. If it is truth that God wants the people to hear, the Lord is going to impress upon more than one or two people that it needs to be presented. That is just a rule. If you study Christian history, that's the way it was in the Second Advent Movement. That's the way it was uh, in the time of the Protestant Reformation. That's the way it was in the time of the Apostles. If it is something that God's people need to hear now, the Lord is going to impress more than one person with, with this truth. <clears throat> have men of experience examined it? That's a third question. A fourth question, we studied this a little bit this morning. That is, is it according to the context or the framework of the Bible? Is, it, is the text quoted, the spirit of prophecy quoted, is it according to the context or the framework of the Bible? A fifth question, and we covered this this morning too, and this is a really important one. Is it explicit? In other words, does the Bible explicitly say this? The way Ellen White explained it in Great Controversy, page 595, she said, before accepting any doctrine or precept, we should demand, she uses the word demand, we should demand a plain, thus saith the Lord, and his support. That's fair. If, if it's something that I need to know and accept and teach and follow and preach, well, then there will be, be something in inspired writings that just plain say it. I will not have to read between the lines. Uh, I'm always nervous when somebody comes to me with a teaching and to, and to figure it out. You have to read this, and then you have to read that, and then you have to think, well, if this is so, and that is so, and that is so, well, then maybe this is so. See, that's not explicit. You have to read something into something. You have to read something between the lines. That's not safe. If it's really important, there will be a plain statement in inspired writings that just come out and say it. That's question number five. And then here is question number six, and this is also an important one. This was actually drilled into me when I studied theology 40 or over 40 years ago. And this question is, do other inspired writers explain it this way? Remember what we studied this morning when we read the Ellen White quotes, and I won't take time to read them again now. The Bible explains itself. The Bi the, in the Bible, the in internal evidence, there is the key for unlocking things in the Bible. We read two or three statements about that this morning. That's why we compare Scripture with Scripture. Because the Bible explains the Bible. And so the sixth question is, do other inspired writers understand this statement, this text, the way I'm explaining it? And that's a valid question to ask, because the Bible explains itself. Now, I want to study with you the last few minutes we have about getting along with heretics and heresies. And when we study the ministry of the Apostle Paul, one of the things that we find out is that his ministry was shortened because of heresy among, that is strong, I don't know if I should say this or not. The Apostle Paul's ministry was shortened 
on account of heresy within the apostolic church among the leaders themselves. That's what shortened the ministry of the Apostle Paul. And that is very, very clear in the book Sketches from the Life of Paul. Uh, in uh, Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 226, she says this. She says, when Peter had been made a prisoner and condemned to death, the brethren had offered earnest prayer to God day and night for his deliverance, but no such interest was manifested in behalf of him who was looked upon as an apostate from Moses, a teacher of dangerous doctrines. So how did the leaders in the Christian church look at the Apostle Paul? They said he's an apostate. And they said he's a teacher of dangerous doctrines. And are you aware of the fact that Ellen White says that there were these Judaizing teachers that went to every single church that the Apostle Paul raised up and tried to turn them against him? That would be quite a situation to be in. And that's a situation he was in for many years. Sometimes we are our own worst enemy. Jesus said, a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Who were Jesus' worst enemies? Were they the Romans? Absolutely not. His worst enemies, the worst enemies of our Savior were the professed people of God, the chosen people of God were his worst enemies. The apostolic church... It pains me to say this, but it's true. The apostolic church was the worst enemy of the Apostle Paul, the leading apostle. It was because of the apostolic church that his ministry was shortened. Ellen White's very clear about that. Uh, for instance, she says... She, she likens his situation to the situation of Jesus and the situation of Elijah and Elisha. Here's the way she explains it. She says, There are but few who perceive the full import of the words of Christ when in the synagogue at Nazareth he announced himself as the anointed one. He reminded them how God in the past turned away from his chosen people because of their unbelief and rebellion and had manifested himself to those in a heathen land who had not rejected the light from heaven. And then she says, she talks about Elijah and Elisha being sent to heathen, Naaman and the widow of Sarepta. Then she says, it is impossible for the worldly and pleasure-loving to rightly value the messages of warning and reproof which God sends to correct the errors of his people. And they, she talks about how that they think that the true messenger is speaking unnecessarily harsh and severe. And then she says, God, Christ present, presented before the assembly at Nazareth a fearful truth when he declared that with backsliding Israel there was no safety for the faithful messenger of God. They would not know his worth or appreciate his labors. While they professed to have great zeal, for the honor of God and the good of Israel, they were the worst enemies of both. God sent Elijah to the widow of Sarepta because he could not trust him with Israel. These cutting reproofs, though presented by the majesty of heaven, the Jews of Nazareth refused to hear. They had but a moment before a witness to the gracious words that proceeded from his lips. The Spirit of God was speaking to their hearts. But the instant a reflection was cast upon them at the first intimation that persons of other nations could be more worthy of the favor of God than they, those proud unbelieving Jews were frantic with rage. They manifested the same spirit toward Christ which their forefathers had manifested toward Elijah. And then, <clears throat> she says, all of this applies to the case of the Apostle Paul. Notice what she says. She says, the Savior's words of reproof to the men of Nazareth apply in the case of Paul. 
not only to the unbelieving Jews, but to his own brethren in the faith. Notice it's his own brethren. In the, the leaders in the, in the Christian church, including some of the apostles. Just read the book of Acts. She says, had the leaders in the church, she's talking about the leaders in the apostolic church at Jerusalem, had the leaders in the church fully surrendered their feelings of bitterness toward the apostle and accepted him as one specially called of God to bear the gospel to the Gentiles, the Lord would have spared him to them to still labor for the salvation of souls. But they considered Paul an apostate from Moses and a teacher of dangerous doctrines. They were the heretics, but they considered Paul to be the heretic. That's always the way it is. It says, He who sees the end from the beginning and who understands the hearts of all saw what would be the result of the envy and jealousy cherished toward Paul. My dear friends, we must never have envy or jealousy or negative feelings toward people that are involved in any kind of heresy. God can never use us to help us if we have those kind of thoughts or feelings. God had not in his providence ordained that Paul's labor should so soon end, but he did not work a miracle to counteract the train of circumstances to which their own course gave rise. The same spirit is still leading to the same results. The same spirit is still leading toward the same results. He says, the great work for us as Christians, this is all in Sketches of the Life of Paul, around page 225, 235, in there. The great work for us as Christians is not to criticize the character and motives of others, but to closely examine our own heart and life, to jealously guard ourselves against the suggestions of Satan. And then she says, there is the same dislike of reproof and correction among the professed people of God today as in the days of of our Savior. Is that true? Is that till true? You see, we talked a little bit about it this morning. When a person's mind becomes in bondage to prejudice, bigotry, when that happens, no amount of evidence is going to change that person. By the way, what we're talking about is especially important for those of you that are working as Bible workers. Because you're working with people, they have prejudice. They are prejudiced against what you and I are teaching. Do you understand that? And let me tell you something. When somebody is prejudiced against what you or I or what we're teaching them, there is no amount of evidence that you can give that's going to change their mind. Because they're victims of that prejudice, and the only way that their mind will ever be changed is if the Holy Spirit convicts their heart. That's why Ellen White says in the book Christ's Object Lesson, she says the ministry is powerless because of lack of the Holy Spirit. She says, unless the Holy Spirit convicts the heart, not one soul will be converted. Nobody will be converted. Now, you may baptize. You may bring some unconverted people into the church. But unless the Holy Spirit, you see... Only divine power can get past that prejudice. Now, go look, go look at the book, Acts of the Apostles, or Sketches from the Life of Paul. You'll see that. I touched on it very briefly this morning. She talks about it over and over again. In the case of the Apostle Paul, remember, what did it take to get through to his mind? Even the martyrdom of Stephen didn't make it. Now, he wrestled night, whole nights, Ellen White says, with his conscience after that, because he saw the glory of God on Stephen's face when he was stoned to death. But even that didn't do it. That's, that's how difficult prejudice is to reach. And that's why in all of our work, is in our Bible work, in evangelism of any kind, we have, that's why we need to pray day by day and say, Lord, baptize us with your Holy Spirit. Send your Spirit to convict the hearts of the people because only the Holy Spirit can get through that prejudice, that bigotry that we have to... Ellen White, by the way, says that men are even more prejudiced, they're even more bigoted today than they were in the days of Christ. So unless the Holy Spirit gets through that, it's hopeless. There's nothing that you and I can do. No amount of evidence 
when I was a, a very young, I was very stupid too. I thought I had an I thought I had an analytical mind. So I thought, well, you just show the person the evidence. I found out very quickly you can show you can show all the evidence you want. You can show the whole evidence in the Bible. It won't convict them unless the Holy Spirit gets through and, and drives it home to the heart. And that's what happened on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached. The Holy Spirit, Ellen White says, the Holy Spirit drove the truth home to their heart. They were pricked, it says, in their heart. The Holy Spirit pricked their heart. And then they said, oh, oh, what are we going to do? That's what we need. Unless the Holy Spirit pricks the heart when we teach, because people are so prejudiced, we'll never be able to get through. We'll never be able to get through to them. Now, in the Adventist Church, we have had some experience we have had some experience in dealing with theological controversy. Your, when I was in school, we were told that in 1888, that in the Adventist Church, at the General Conference of Minneapolis, that there arose a controversy about the law in Galatians. Now, that, that, that the law of Galatians was, I've been studying that, by the way, lately, and someday, if the Lord wills, I might even preach a sermon about it. Uh, is a lot more actually than the law of Galatians. That was just the tip of the iceberg. But did you know that both sides were wrong? You know what the sides were? E.J. Wagner and J.H. Wagner. J.H. Wagner was E.J. Wagner's father. Wagner's, both the father and son, both said that the law in Galatians was the moral law. And Elder Uriah Smith and J.H. Butler and a whole bunch of other leading ministers said, no, the law in Galatians is the ceremonial law. And they had this, and the General Conference President of the Review and Herald article said, concerning Joseph and Wagner, they're going to destroy Adventism. Because if you say that the law in Galatians was a moral law, that will destroy our position. People will think they don't even need to keep the Sabbath or keep the moral law at all. So they had this controversy. I want to read to you what Ellen White said about this controversy about the law of Galatians. You're going to find out when I read this that both sides were wrong. I have discovered in my experience that this is the case more, much more than 50% of the time. In, in theological controversy, more than 50% of the time, both sides are wrong, or at least partly wrong, and maybe partly right. But neither side is really right, more than 50% of the time. Now, that's one of the reasons we all need to be humble when we're looking at all kind of controversial things. Here's, this is in uh, nine manuscript releases, page 218. Ellen White is speaking about a vision that she had about this problem. She said, he, that is the angel that was speaking to her, he stretched out his arms. Now, this is in a vision that Ellen White had. And she's seen an angel stretch out his arms toward Dr. Wagner and to you, Elder Butler. Now remember, Dr. Wagner was over here and he said, the law in Galatians, especially in Galatians 3, is the moral law. And Elder Butler said, no, it's not. It's the ceremonial law. So they had this difference of opinion. And here's... The angel stretched out his arms toward Dr. Wagner and to you, Elder Butler, and said in substance as follows, quote, Neither have all the light upon the law. Neither position is perfect. Interesting, isn't it? Both of them were partly wrong. <laughs> Since this is the case in theological controversy, more than 50% of the time, we always have to be, we talked a little bit about humility this morning, we always have to be humble when we're investigating controversial things and looking at controversial things. That wasn't the only time they had a difference of opinion. There was a, because of these differences of opinion about some theological understandings of prophecy, there was published in the review an article by A.T. Jones.
And in the very same Review and Herald that had this article by A.T. Jones, there was an article by Uriah Smith countering what Elder Jones said. And I want to read you what Ella White said about that. She says, It makes my heart ache to read the articles in the Review that published to the world that we are at variance. One feels moved to present the coming conflict in strong lies as he views it. Then our good brother Smith gives the trumpet a counterblast to make of none effect the warnings given in the same issue. If he, even if he did see that Elder Jones was too fast, what was his work? Go to Brother Jones, talk with him before his piece was inserted in the review. This would be doing the works of Christ. But to put that article in the paper from Elder Jones, and then Elder Smith write as he has done an article in the same issue, is entirely contrary to the light which the Lord has given me. So, the bigger leader you are, the bigger mistake you can make. She, in talking about these things, if you want to read that statement, by the way, that's in the 1888 materials, around about 998, right in there in the next several pages. In talking about these things, Ellen White likened it to the trial of the disciples on the Sea of Galilee when they were in the storm that night, and... She says that Jesus is just as near to us amid scenes of tempest and trial as he was to his followers who were tossed on the Sea of Galilee. Christ is on board the vessel. Believe that Christ is our captain, that he will take care not only of us but the ship. But then she gives some interesting counsel about the future. Here's what she says is going to happen. This is on page 1002 in the 1888 materials. She says, dark hours of trial are before the church. Why? Why is it that dark hours of trial are in our future? Notice why. Because they have not obeyed the warnings and reproofs and counsel of God. What a bewitching power comes upon human minds to do contrary to the oft-repeated will of God. That night in that boat was to the disciples a school where they were to receive their education for the great work which was to be done afterward. The storm was not sent upon the disciples to shipwreck them, but to test and prove them individually. Now notice what she says is going to happen. Before the great trouble shall come upon the world, such as has never been since there was a nation. When is that? That's the great time of trouble. She's quoting, actually, partly from Daniel 12, 1. That's the great time of trouble after probation closes. Before the great trouble shall come upon the world, such as has never been since there was a nation, those who have faltered and who would ignorantly lead in unsafe paths will reveal this before the real vital test the last proving comes, so that whatsoever they may say will not be regarded as voicing the true shepherd. That's an amazing statement. I've read it many times. She says, before the great trouble comes, that's the time of trouble after the close of probation, the people who would ignorantly, now she's not accusing them of, of being uh, a Judas. She's not uh, accusing them of, of being uh, unfaithful of the Lord, but they're ignorantly would lead in unsafe paths because they don't know what they're talking about. She says these people will reveal this before the great trouble comes so that whatever they say, people will know that they don't need to pay attention to that. So very, you read it yourself. It's in page 1002 in the 1888 materials. She says, the time of our educating will soon be over. We have no time to lose in walking through clouds of doubt and uncertainty because of uncertain voices. Well, if 
we have a lot of uncertain voices today. We have to look over many, many things and ask ourselves the question, is this new truth that I need to to learn from the Bible and spirit of prophecy or is it just some old teaching that the church rejected hundreds of years ago? And one last point I want to cover with you before we close this evening. We, as Seventh-day Adventists, are reformers. God has sent us into the world as reformers, not because of our wisdom or intellect, but the Lord has given us the spirit of prophecy. The Lord has given us instruction for the word, world so that the world could have the information they needed to prepare for the second coming of Christ. That's what we're here for. And so we are reformers. But to be a successful and efficient reformer, it is necessary to be wise and understand something about human nature. And how can I illustrate it best? If you have to climb up on a ladder to to do something on a wall, you can't go from the bottom step to the top step of the ladder all in one step. You have to take one step and then another step and then another step. And as reformers, we must understand that we can't take the people from where they are to where we are in one step. That can't happen. They can't do that. That's impossible. Are you all aware of the fact that Ellen White says that if God had shown the 16th century reformers all the truth, they would have rejected it? They couldn't take that all at one time. And so the people that we work with, the people that we're trying to help. We cannot take them from where they are to where we are all in one step. It's a series of steps. They have to learn one thing and then another thing and then another thing and then another thing. That's true in every area of reform. Whether you're talking about health reform, diet reform, dress reform, whatever. How to keep the Sabbath. You can't take the people from where they are to where you are in one step. I want to read something that Ellen White wrote about this. It's in Volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 21. It says, We should be very cautious not to advance too fast, lest we be obliged to retrace our steps. In reforms, we would better come one step short of the mark than to go one step beyond it. And if there is error at all, let it be on the side next to the people. That's a very interesting statement. If there's error at all, let it be on the side next to the people. If you're going to make a mistake, it'd be better to come one step short of the mark than to go one step beyond the mark. Well, the wisdom of Jesus in dealing with heresy is something that has astonished my mind over and over again. And if we pray and say, Lord, you have promised that if we would ask that we would receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can teach you. If you're a Bible worker, the Holy Spirit can teach you and show you what to say and what not to say. It's important to know what to say. It's also important to know what not to say when you're dealing with another individual. The Holy Spirit knows everything about that person's background and about their mental makeup and their temperament and what they can understand and what they don't understand. And only the Holy Spirit can guide you to say the right thing and to avoid saying what shouldn't be said. But the Holy Spirit can do that. And in our work for others, we need to ask the Lord to give us wisdom as we deal with heresy day by day, because we deal with it every day. The Lord will give us wisdom and the patience and forbearance and kindness of Jesus. Remember, when you read the Gospels, you will notice that many times when Jesus dealt with heresy, he just ignored it and went on and and presented to them what he wanted to present and didn't even answer their question because it would just arouse controversy. So he just let that be, teach them what they need to know, and leave the rest aside. 
Let's pray that the Lord will help us to become Christ-like, that we will have the wisdom of a serpent and the, that we will also be as harmless as the dove. Let's pray before we go. Father in heaven, we thank you that when we were ruined, that you devised a way to save us. And Lord, we are human, and all of us have our own prejudices. We all are affected by the bigotry and prejudice that affects all the members of the human race. And we don't even know ourselves, but we look to you, and we earnestly pray that you will impart to each one of us your Holy Spirit. We know that your Spirit can get through all of our prejudices, all the bigotry of the human race, and that you can deal with the situation that we need to deal with individually. And Lord, we pray that your Spirit will work in our heart and mind and help us to be humble enough so that we can be molded and fashioned and shaped and reshaped by the agencies of heaven that are sent to deliver us from the hole of sin in which we find ourselves. And we pray that you will cause this plan of salvation that originated with you, that you have devised and carried out up to the present time, we pray that you will cause this plan of salvation to work out in each of our hearts and minds. Deliver us, we pray, from ourselves and help us to see clearly what you want us to see, to do what you want us to do, and to be the people that you want us to be, waiting for the soon appearing of your Son in the clouds of heaven. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.